to the Technical University. Hannah, very nice uh, to have you, and take it away. Okay. Does it work? Yeah, okay, it works, okay. Uh, thank you for the organizers for organizing this. This is a very nice opportunity. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so this is my talk on uh, convolutions, basically. Originally, I uh, promised to also talk about depth, but due to some issues, I couldn't really uh, add that part to it. But that leaves us more time to talk about convolution, so I can really explain it in depth. Um, so I'm currently working at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Data and AI cluster, and I'm also associated to the Vrij Universiteit Brussel, which is in Belgium, but the Eindhoven University of Technology is in the Netherlands. And I have some, so Aurelien Volant is my PhD student, and I have some other collaborators who are mentioned there. And uh, yeah, so let's move on to the topic. So. The actual question uh, that I asked myself when I started this research is like, how does the use of convolutions change what, when, and how a network learns? So basically, once you add uh, an architectural change to your network, what it learns will obviously change, or how it works will obviously change. And there was already a theory about linear, fully connected networks, and I wanted to check, okay, what if you have uh, yeah, addition of convolutions, how will this work differently? Um, so I compared, uh, well, because we are doing it mathematically, we keep things very, very simple. So it's not really like in a practical setting like you would use in uh, modern day machine learning, let's say. But uh, just to kind of focus on the real um, thing of changing, of making this change in the architecture, I compared uh, a very simple two layer fully connected network and a convolutional network, which has just like one single channel one convolution in the first layer and another fully connected layer added at the end. And uh, both networks are linear. Again, not very practical. And you might also wonder like, how could this be any different because they're both linear models? Well, their dynamics are really different as we will show. And how they process information is also really different. So although the predictions might be the same in the end, the loss might reach the same value, how they achieve this is very different. So that's, I think, why it's interesting to study them and to maybe hopefully later go on to more complex and nonlinear stuff. So uh, yeah, as a quick reminder, so how does a 2D convolution work? Well, this is very simple. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully this is just repetition for you. So you have an input image and you convolve with a kernel. It just basically means that you put the kernel on top of this input image like uh, it is shown by the colors. Then you uh, multiply all the elements, take the sum, and then you have the first uh, let's say, output value of your uh, output image or output, uh, yeah, matrix, let's say. Then you switch, so then we go to step B, we use slide with a certain stride, it's called. Here the stride is one, so you stride the slide to the left uh, or to the right, and uh, you, you get the next value, and then you go on. Okay, so with this simple, very simple setup in mind, we have two very simple networks. Uh, let's do some experiments to show what actually is the difference. So uh, we assume a uh, mean squared error loss, also to make things a little bit easier to analyze. We start from small random initial conditions and we have a very low learning rate. And our data set is also very simple. So we have like four images of four classes. Uh, one is a circle, an octagon, a square, and a star. So very simple setup. And uh, they are one hot encoded, so they each have their label. And we do a, run a little experiment on that. So again, with this uh, setup, one important thing for the mathematics is that we do convolutions with full kernels. So that means that the, uh, the kernel is actually the size of the input image, which is a little bit weird, um, because normally you would make it smaller, the convolutional kernel. Um, but that's mathematically also a step ahead. So let's, let's do the simple uh, setup where we have a kernel that is the same uh, dimension as the image, and then when you reach the end of the image, let's say here, you just repeat uh, the values from the other side. So it's kind of like wrapping around your kernel around the image. Okay, so and this is like, it seems uh, weird, but this is actually focusing on the pure fact that you repeat weights and slide weights over the image. Okay, and then uh, to, to show the, uh, oh, I don't know if it's really, it looks very weird on the screen. <laughs> okay, anyway. So um, what I'll show in the next slide are some results of how the kernels and how the weight matrices evolve over time. 
And uh, to actually visualize it, I decided to always take, like uh, when you have your fully connected neural network, you take in the first layer, you take one of the nodes in the hidden layer, and you just select all the values that go to that node. So if your original input is uh, n by n pixels, you will have n squared values. And these n squared values of the weight matrix, you can again reshape into a little uh, image, right? So you get this n squared by one vector from taking all these values, and you, you put it again in n by n image, okay? And it will become clear in the next slide why this is uh, interesting to do. So if we uh, like train our two networks, or very simple networks on this data set, you see that they both seen, uh, achieve the same loss. Uh, so this is uh, the squared ones are the uh, convolutional networks and the, the one with the little dots is, um, is a fully connected neural network. Uh, they do so with a kind of different dynamic because they're kind of delayed and so forth that I'll discuss um, later, but not a lot in detail because what I want to focus on is what actually is inside the networks, right? What are the weights representing? What are the par parameters representing? And these little squares are like I discussed before. So you take one of those, uh, uh, randomly you select one of the nodes that are in the hidden layer, you take all the values that go to there, you make a little square of it again, and then you visualize it over time. So since we're starting from random initial conditions, well, the first visualization of these weights are just random uh, numbers, small random numbers. And as the training progresses, you see that they really take on some information about the data set of these geometric figures. So really your parameters really represent something about the data set, and I will discuss later what this actually means. Now when you look at the kernel of the convolution, you can do the same thing. So you just take the kernel, and we also start from random initial values, uh, and you follow over time what this kernel looks like, and it starts to look like it's much less like uh, recognizable visually, let's say. Uh, and it's a little bit of a blur thing, so it's also kind of a question, okay, but what, what does this mean? And maybe the main question is, how does this relate to the data set it's trying to process? Okay, so that's what this will be about. So, um, so, oh, okay. um, so we have equations of gradient descent, and we're going to try and find out from these equations and the data set and our architectures how this all works. Now, the equations themselves are not very revealing, so we have to kind of manipulate them and rewrite them and work with them until we arrive at the point where we can recognize um, what's going on and we have like an understanding of what, yeah, of, of the whole process. Now, I'm not claiming that you can, well, it's also, also not possible actually to really solve the equations, so you might think that, oh, at some point you might arrive at an actual solution for a uh, case here, the values of the kernel or the values of the um, uh, weight matrix of the, of the second layer of this uh, convolution network. Um, well, this is not possible in general, but we can manipulate the equations to see, like uh, we end up with a set of differential equations where you can see how all things interact. And I think that's the uh, interesting part about it. So let's go back to our convolution. Well, if we want to um, compare the convolutional neural network with the fully connected neural network, we already, there's already kind of theory for the fully connected neural network, which I will like give the reference to later. So I thought it would be easier to just try and reframe this theory for the fully connected neural network in terms of the convolutional neural network. But for that to happen, we have to rewrite a convolutional operation uh, in terms of a, a let's say, a fully connected uh, network with, very, with a very specific structure. So let me explain. You have this convolution that's going on here, like we discussed before, and actually when you would want to rewrite this or visualize this as a fully connected weight matrix, but that is not fully connected, just a weight matrix actually, is that you, uh, you can take the values of the kernel and put them on the specific places in the weight matrix. And then you have everything else zero. So for example, to arrive at our first value here, we can take the first value, the second value, the third and the fourth value of our kernel, put them at the right weights, and make all the other weights zero, going to that value, then you have kind of rewritten it or reconstructed it as a weight, uh, a multiplication with a weight matrix. You can do the same for the second uh, step in your convolution, 
and so forth. So basically, we can reformulate, uh, well, this is the third step, we can reformulate uh, this whole um, convolutional operation as a, well, my screen is a little bit blocked, but <laughs> as um, uh, a multiplication with a, with a weight matrix and the input that is vectorized, okay? So um, you have to put the weights on very specific places and this structure that you end up in the end, this weight matrix, is called a doubly block circulant matrix. So some people might have heard, or most people might have heard about the fact that a convolution, a 1D convolution, gives you a circulant matrix. Uh, because it's a 2D convolution, we end up with a doubly block circulant matrix. So it's a matrix with a very specific structure. And what you have then in the end is like, if you do the convolution on this side, and you flatten in the end to pass it on to the next layer, you might as well just uh, apply this doubly block circulant matrix, which is a function of the kernel, uh, to the flattened input, and then you have the same result. Okay, and uh, why is this so interesting to do? Well, then you can start to describe the specific structure of this weight matrix by looking at its uh, eigenvalue decomposition. And a weight matrix in a fully connected neural network can have any, basically there's no constraints beforehand on its eigenvalue decomposition. But because we're doing a convolution here, and because we're looking at this doubly block circular matrix that has a very specific structure with the repeated weights, and things that are put to zero and stuff like that. Uh, it has a fixed uh, eigenvalue decomposition, and this uh, fixed eigenvalue decomposition is very closely related to Fourier transforms. So um, the uh, eigenvectors of these matrix are actually, whew, sorry, I need to drink a little bit. <laughs> so the eigenvectors of these matrix are actually um, the Fourier, base vectors in the sense that if you take a column or a row of this Q matrix and you again reshape it into a little square, you'll see these uh, distinct uh, frequency patterns or the spatial frequency patterns. So you have horizontal uh, and vertical frequency, okay? So these are the eigenvectors and what's on the diagonal here, so this is diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues of the W block circular matrix are in fact the Fourier coefficients of the kernel. Um, so for the physicist here, I mean, if you uh, multiply this uh, W block circular matrix of the kernel with the input, well then you would first take the Fourier transform of the kernel, multiply with uh, the Fourier values of the kernel, and then transform back to the pixel domain. Um, okay, so that was the data set, uh, sorry, the structure of the, um, network, we will get it back later, so keep it in mind, Fourier coefficients and so forth. Now let's talk a little bit about the data set structure, which is another important aspect of what we are trying to solve. And in the case of linear networks, I mean, data set structure in general is very like ill-defined. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of ways to think about the structure in a data set, but in the case of a linear network, well, we can actually um, look at a very easy kind of structure, let's say. And this easy kind of structure is given by uh, the input-output correlation matrix. So what we do is we take all the uh, ground truth labels, we take a, a, a tensor, so we flatten the inputs, at the samples, we take a tensor product with them, and then we just average overall samples. So this is like uh, this, we get a sigma y x matrix, and p is the number of classes, for example, here is four, and then uh, the other dimension is n squared, is the number of pixels uh, squared. Okay, and then to look at the structure, a little bit of visualization. Um, well, uh, I guess you all kind of know how to do a singular value decomposition, so we end up, if we take the singular value decomposition of this uh, sigma yx, so of the input-output correlation matrix, we end up with three matrices. Um, S, uh, with the matrix with the singular values, is actually important in dynamics because it tells you when something will be learned, but I'm not going to go too much into detail into this because we don't have that much time either. What I think is uh, nice to, to uh, see is that in this matrix V, um, we have actually this kind of information about the data set. So the singular vectors V are actually, if you intuitively, intuitively think about them, are V 
the information that you need to distinguish between the classes from broader to finer distinctions. I will I'll explain this more in the next slide. So first, let's look, let's look into uh, this decomposition in modes that we can, so the singular modes that we can build from this. So if you take the first row, uh, the first column here with the singular value S and the first row here, you make a cross product or a tensor product, you can actually decompose your original matrix into these four modes just uh, visualized. And then what, does the, what do these modes mean? So uh, if we look at the, the visualization of the modes, what I mean with that is again, we constantly switch from, from vectors to uh, matrices and so forth. So in the first mode, you have the first row. And if you take this n squared number of values and you reshape it again in n by n matrix, you get this first image here. And then you have the second row, you get the second image and so forth. So this is the first mode, this is the second mode visualized, and then we have the third mode and the fourth mode. You can sum them again, and then uh, over time it kind of starts to become clear what these modes mean, so you have a very, like you can interpret them and see a kind of structure in the data set. So the first mode is arguably like not, not really interesting in the sense that it's just like an average overall um, classes, but then in the second mode you can see that well, if you sum the, the, sorry, the first and the second mode, you can see that there's no real difference between the first two uh, images and the last two images. So you kind of split the data set into two big groups. One is like the roundish images and the other one is like the, other one is like the non roundish images. And I think it's most clear with the fourth mode, uh, which is actually talking about uh, the boundary that you need to distinguish a circle from a octagon. So in the last mode, you can actually use to uh, make that final distinction, this very fine-grained distinction between a circle and an octagon. Okay, of course I picked this example to be quite neat. <laughs> it's not always like that, right? But this is just uh, kind of a toy example to, to show uh, what it does. Okay, so we have our, all our ingredients at this point. Uh, we have um, the structure of the data set which is actually given by this V matrix, so these singular values, which are, uh, well, now they're really small, but these are just, let me just go back to them. Uh, here on the side, you can see that they are really these information about how to make distinctions between the modes, uh, between the classes, sorry. Yes. Then we have uh, the fact that we're working with a convolution, so we made all this kind of, um, or we have all this kind of insights about uh, that a convolution can be rewritten, and then we have the fact that it can be expressed in terms of Fourier transforms. And so the important matrix here is V, and the important matrix here is Q. Okay, let's put them together into our gradient descent equations, manipulate everything, and try to see um, how it evolves. Okay, and then I <laughs> take a huge leap, <laughs> because it would take so much time to actually go over the details. Um, so I just give you like a very short overview and then you can check the respective papers to actually do the derivations yourself if you would like to. But the first thing we do is like, okay, we're going to assume not the gradient descent, but gradient flow, which means that we're going to switch from gradient uh, updates to um, uh, differential equations. So we study like over time. Another mathematical thing we, we do is like we constantly take this uh, U and V that are uh, our data set related to our data set, and we rewrite all the different uh, parameters and so forth kind of in this basis to see how the revolution will relate to this data set structure. And another thing we do is we, we make a, um, a similar matrix like we did with the ground truth labels, but now with the predictions of the network. So we have a sigma y hat x, which is the correlation between uh, the predictions of the network and the input samples. And we again take this U and V from our original ground truth data set, so the real data set structure, and we um, use them to, to get this matrix A. So A is basically uh, telling us something about the predictions of the network over time in terms of the data set structure. Okay. And then, uh, so on the fully connected side, so this is uh, some a work you might already know by Andrew Saxa and colleagues, is that uh, for the two layers, we end up with uh, two differential equations. 
one equation, uh, obviously, for the first um, fully connected layer, one equation for the second uh, fully connected layer. They are coupled, so the first uh, fully connected layer involves in turn the second fully connected layer. And uh, importantly, this A matrix, which is like the, the predictions of the network, goes to S, meaning that the predictions of the networks gradually evolve towards the ground truth label. So when you train it, it goes like this. Um, and when you solve it, uh, and there's some additional assumptions here, you can get this very nice sigmoidal behavior. So things are learned in order from broader to finite distinctions. Now, um, oh, sorry. When you look at the convolutional side, you have a very, very similar um, type of network structure, it seems. But this time, we had to re rewrite uh, the kernel and the fully connected layer in a different, uh, in a different way. So what I'm, I'm talking about here is actually the evolution of the Fourier coefficients of the kernel. So this is telling you how the Fourier coefficients of the kernel will evolve over time. And what is the biggest difference, basically, is that there is this part here. And this part, if you remember, is actually the interaction between the data set structure and our convolutional network. So um, given that we have a convolution, this is now going to interact with the data set structure in a way that wasn't there when you look at the fully connected side. Um, and this basically determines then the whole uh, process of uh, what we see, what we saw in those uh, uh, parameters in, the, in these networks that I visualized before. Um, okay, so next slide. Oops. Right, okay, so, um, yeah, so if you look at it, these equations actually tell you, especially if you uh, go to the paper and would like read more about what the actual parameters of the fully connected neural network then look like, well, they are actually combinations of our singular vectors that are the structure of the data set. So especially in this example, you could really recognize as well at some point, this um, part of the weight matrix starts to specialize in trying to distinguish these very uh, fine boundary between um, the circle and the octagon and other neurons or other parts are doing something different depending on their initial conditions. So that's quite interesting already. Uh, I think it just, I mean, for me, it's quite interesting because it shows that at least for a linear network, there is like information about the data set really stored in the parameters, like one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not like the input samples, it's like the information you need to distinguish between them that is used by the network. And uh, for our uh, fully, uh, sorry, for a convolutional network, we, we still have maybe, we lack this insight, okay, it's going to have something to do with frequencies uh, of these things, but what does what it actually do? Well, um, yeah, this is then solved, okay. To do this mathematically, we have to make one extra assumption. And um, so this is, okay, so this part is like, we make an extra assumption which is not really practical in real life, but it helps us to gain insight about, okay, these differential equations again. And I think the end result also very nicely shows why a convolutional neural network would work differently and it's kind of like the inductive bias of using purely convolutions. And it's also something you cannot see from just looking at, um, I mean, you have to really analyze the differential equations and the evolution over time to really see this effect. So the assumption that we make here, well, to make it uh, mathem mathematically a little bit easier to do is like, okay, we have the interaction between Q and V. So what do we do? We, well, we make our data set such that it's kind of nicely uh, easier to analyze when you have a convolution. That means that we um, make a data set that is actually uh, in terms of just a couple of frequencies, and we make sure that nothing couples in a way, so the dynamics are easily solvable. So uh, to give you an example, well, let's, let's take two classes here. We make two classes, and we just make them uh, as a sum of different uh, spatial frequencies with different uh, amplitudes, let's say. So um, the first, um, Class here is just a, a sum of these two, uh, these three frequencies, and the second class is a, a sum of three different frequencies. So that's the point we, we want to uncouple things. And if you look at their um, amplitudes, you also see that okay, for the first class, the first two amplitudes are quite close, and then it drops. So the last addition is a bit smaller, and then 
the second class has like lower amplitudes in general and they are a little bit more different maybe as well. So that's the example that we have here. And this um, Q uh, phi is actually, um, well, phi is actually a, a, a column of V of the matrix V, a different notation. Maybe I should have used small V, but that was um, uh, like not, not easy for another perspective. So, um, sorry, confusing from another perspective. So a column of V is phi, so it's one of those singular vectors of the data set. And we take um, the, um, uh, Fourier transform of this of this vector of the data set, the single vector of the data set, and then you get different coefficients. And these are the important numbers that determine the dynamics, actually. So the interaction between the the, uh, the convolution through this Fourier transform and the data set through this uh, vector phi. Okay, and then uh, if we make an assumption about the data set in this way we can actually rewrite our uh, equation for the kernel, or at least for the Fourier coefficients of the kernel. So how do the Fourier coefficients of the kernel evolve over time? Well, first you have this term that makes it a little bit exponential in the beginning, because it's like a variable itself. And then another, another aspect is that this evolution is also determined by, again, the interaction between uh, the convolution and the singular vectors of the data set. And then this S minus A, so this is meaning that the, the predictions go to the ground truth values over time. Okay, and what is important here is that you have one of those equations for each frequency that is uh, present in the kernel. And the effect of these equations is that they are going to race against each other. So if they, they all start with their initial values and they all start more or less exponentially growing, but then there is a factor that makes a kind of lateral inhibition, meaning that if one grows very la large, it will inhibit the growth of any other frequency. So basically they're kind of like, if one of them or a couple of them are quite large, they start growing very fast and they're just inhibiting the growth of any other uh, kernel, uh, uh, frequency of the kernel. Meaning that the final kernel will only consist of a number of, of a small number of frequencies. And which of these frequencies depends largely on how important that frequency is in the data set structure, in uh, the, thank you, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so the frequencies that win, basically, are the frequencies that are important to distinguish between classes. Um, so I have a little, yeah, I have a little, uh, we run, again, run the experiment and show that this is really what happens. So, um, and remember our two examples from before. So we have two classes that are made up out of these frequencies. If you look at uh, the dynamics, which I, again, uh, didn't really talk about in detail, but you can actually predict which will be learned first. And the one with the bigger amplitudes will be learned first. So this is a kind of curve that tells you like over time, uh, the first class will be learned first, and then the second class will be learned with this sigmoidal trajectory. But then we can look at, um, so these are the, 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 the Fourier coefficient of the kernel. So for each frequency of the kernel, we plot, this, um, we plot this evolution. And we look at our kernel again over time and we see, okay, so the kernel in the beginning, well, random initial values, small random initial values, nothing really there. And then when the first uh, mode or class is learned, basically, our kernel is a sum of two things. And this sum is actually only the first two frequencies that were present in this class, and the last one has been discarded. And this is exactly because we are only taking frequencies that are important for the data set. We constructed it such that those two frequencies are like with, uh, close, uh, close to each other and are both very important in our data set. And then the kernel uh, goes on and it learns another frequency. And of these last three frequencies, well, they're really different in terms of importance because the, 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 the first one has a bigger, uh, let's say, importance. So this one will grow very fast and it will inhibit the other two frequencies. And therefore, the final kernel only consists of three out of the six initial frequencies that we had. So this process of winner-takes-all dynamics kind of... Uh, yeah, it's a kind of implicit regularization that you can only see from the dynamics, I think, uh, that tells you, okay, this convolution will focus on frequencies that are important in the data set and not, like a fully connected neural network, incorporate the full information. 
uh, yeah, so that's the, the take home message. So the final kernel consists of the dominant frequencies of the frequency spectra of each singular vector of the data set. So it's two things. You have the structure of the data set with singular vectors, structure of the network, and therefore you have this interaction. So this explains this. So fully connected takes on the whole data set structure. The kernel here only takes on some important frequencies and make this kind of blurry uh, addition in the end. And then if you, um, I mean, we made a very specific assumption about the data set, which is one of the many assumptions we had to take. Uh, if you release a little bit of that uh, and you look, for example, at Sci-Fi 10, again, with linear networks, so it's not really uh, practical still. But uh, when, you, when you do kind of the same thing for uh, Sci-Fi 10, you can see that you have a similar effect. So the, the weights in a fully, oh, sorry. The weights in a fully connected neural network will, if you compute the modes of Cypher 10, you will see that this is kind of what they look like. So you, um, you see that the network learns those. And then for a kernel, uh, for a convolutional network, you have, well, if you look at the blue uh, channel, the kernel, let's say, um, the dynamics are not as clean anymore. You have this like uh, coupling stuff, but some frequencies are selected and others are not. And these are basically um, frequencies that are um, important in the data set because for natural images, a lot of uh, important frequencies are actually the low frequencies. So that's why you will see them uh, pop up there. Okay. So, all right. Um, so yeah, um, I just kind of started my group. So <laughs> more research on understanding deep learning is like launching soon. <laughs> so if you're like, a, uh, it's kind of both, um, I aim to do both theoretical work like we just did. Uh, like I just explained, also, for example, Mudassar, who's like an intern with me this summer, he's sitting there. <laughs> so he's working on uh, attention mechanisms to try to put them in the same framework, for example. But we're also trying to do a lot of experimental work because I always like have the comment and I think it's valid that you, you want to like uh, know what, what goes on when you do like a ResNet 50 on ImageNet stuff. So that's what we're also doing. So if you want to reach out or if you want to look for a job in the future, please uh, yeah, check my website or something like that. Uh, or, or meet me for coffee on the conference. And if you want to know more about the, the work, um, then you can always uh, check the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have again time for a couple of questions. Marco. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, so can you say something about the nonlinear case? It seems like a few things will go through because like the decomposition where you have the doubly circle and matrix that clearly still holds, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, well the nonlinear case is, is uh, of course uh, complicated, but it's also more complicated because you have a number of ways you can make it nonlinear. You can make it, uh, for example, adding a softmax already changes a lot. A relu, okay. Um, <laughs> I, well, no, actually, I cannot say a lot about the nonlinear case, uh, specifically about this dominant frequency bias, but we have run experiments with relus um, just to show that the dynamics, so one part of the paper, it's also in the paper, actually, one part of the paper is showing that it still learns, um, the network still learns from these broader to find distinctions between classes, and even if you have a, a, a multi-layer, um, convolutional network with smaller kernels and relus and, you know, kind of what you would expect a little bit more. Um, it still has this kind of dynamic of learning in this order. So it seems like um, some of the dynamics are uh, still um, are still there, but it also seems like it's only the surface in a way. Like intuitively for me, it seems like it's only the surface and for nonlinear cases, you would have to like go below the surface and find um, so for example, this data set structure, taking the mean of the data set structure is only the first, uh, first uh, thing you can do. There's other, way more structure below that. And I think you would have to adapt the dynamics in the equations to also incorporate this much more uh, rich structure of the data set as well. Um, because that's what a nonlinear network does, I guess. It takes out this much more complicated structure out of the data set. And there's nothing there in the equations that, that uh, would allow for that. But the equations seem to at least like uh, broadly describe uh, some phenomena even in nonlinear networks. 
yeah, not, no, not only earlier time dynamics. It seems to go on for like, yeah. But I still kind of like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something we want to uh, like uh, understand better as well because it's, um, well, the work I didn't present, but the, it's, like, it's like showing that indeed you have like first early time dynamics that are linear and then gradually becoming more nonlinear, which kind of makes sense. Um, and it's also in your work, right, that, that you incorporate more and more um, higher order statistics of the data set over time as well. So, I know, there seems to be ways of, ex of extending it in, in terms of like higher order statistics or something like that, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I thought there was another question there, but let's... Thanks. Uh, how does this hold to its depth? Because, for example, for MLP, you showed us, uh, of course, in first hidden layer, there is the structure of the data set, but after it's like, washed out. I'm not sure about I CNNs because there is some locality, but can you comment on this, please? Yes, so uh, in the second, if, if the question is like what happens in the second layer, well, you can show that uh, in the second layer, then you have a kind of a selection process because the first layer, the kernel, is a sum of all important frequencies and the second layer would then have like a mechanism to select the frequencies that tell you which class it is. Um, but if you, look, if you would want to make a theory for even uh, deeper networks, um, well, the original work by Andrew Saxo on, non, uh, on fully connected layers is also for deeper networks. But uh, the deeper you make it, um, I mean, for two-layer networks, you can find an analytical solution, but the deeper you make it, the more complex the equation becomes and it, it doesn't seem to be solvable anymore. Um, but you can kind of see that the dynamics when you, like, uh, it gets a little bit delayed and stuff like that. But that's for a fully connected neural network. For a convolutional network, of course, you have this effect, like if you have smaller kernels and you build up over depth, that there's a receptive field and that you have all these kind of things. Uh, and I, yeah, we also still need to <laughs> work on this. So that's also future work. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thanks. Great. Um, there's another question there in the front. Um, I have one question regarding like the, I'm going like from a convolutional to a fully connected network now. I mean, you showed that in the linear case, one is learning like, let's say structural um, information, the other one's like learning Fourier based. Mm -hmm. um, information. So my question is, I mean, I can, as you've shown, I can write down a fully connect, uh, a convolutional network in terms of a fully connected one. Mm -hmm. So can I somehow relax this bias, like I introduce when writing it down, such that mm. I can maybe learn both? Um. I, I mean, I just have um, shared weights and block mm. matrices. So my question is, can I theoretically, like if I have a data set that um, needs not only a Fourier basis, mm -hmm. but also structural information, can I relax that somehow? Um, okay, so uh, I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but the convolutional stuff is basically a subset of the structural stuff. So um, if you would relax the constraints on the convolution in any way, you would learn other aspects of the, um, of the data set. Not only important frequencies, but uh, I, I mean, uh, you could change the, the constraints on the, okay, you could actually do it like this. So imagine that you would have like uh, any other architecture that you could rewrite in terms of like um, uh, a deco an eigenvalue decomposition. So you have, you have something that adds a very fixed structure to your weight matrix, like the convolution does, uh, and then ends up, you end up with Fourier um, matrices, you could make up any other thing uh, <laughs> and end up with another basis, and then this basis would be the one to understand your data set structure. So you could actually yeah, uh, invent types of networks, I think, that are better uh, suited to um, your data set structure that you already have without having to use a fully connected neural network because the downside of fully connected neural network is that it's so uh, computational intensive. 
So if it wouldn't be so computational intensive, you would, I guess you would always use a fully connected neural network because it does everything. It, it leverages the whole structure. But if you want to save on parameters, you go to convolutions and then you have this inductive bias of frequencies. So perhaps, yeah, indeed you could like uh, make a hybrid or make a something that better suits your data set. Um, of course, you would have to do some computations beforehand on the data set, which might also be very costly. So uh, I guess it depends. I was wondering, you mentioned at some point that you could see that in the convolutional networks, you actually, you know, you, you don't just store patterns, but you store the structure that really helps you classify. Can you see some kind, so this is basically memorization versus generalization, right? So Yes. Can you see some kind of transition in your theory as to, you know, I guess if you have just very few samples, you are going to memorize them. And then maybe uh, later yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So can you see something like a transition in your, in your theory? And yeah, can you compare so this transition between mm. convolutional and fully connected uh, networks? Um, well, I think this, um, this theory, this particular theory, is not very helpful for this because one of the assumptions is, if we go back to this, um, is that there's only one sample per class. So there's basically no, uh, no way to overfit uh, uh, in a sense that you can only just purely solve it. Um, so for that to happen, I don't know if it makes sense, but for that to happen, you would have to uh, include like more variations of one uh, sample in each class, and that would add something to dynamics, and then maybe you would see, would be able to talk in terms of overfitting. But at this point, it's not, I think you, you can't see it from the theory at all. Okay, I don't see any immediate uh, further questions. So let's thank Hannah and Ludovic uh, again for starting the conference. And we are now.